Welcome back to another episode of Light Beer, Dark Money. This is Sean Noble. I'm Chris Clements. And we have our wonderful friend, Pastor Frank, for this is now our second annual Christmas edition. <laughs> yeah, second <laughs> annual holiday, Christmas, Hanukkah, not Kwanzaa. We don't, we don't do that yeah. here. Yeah. But ha- Merry Christmas to all who are listening. Happy yes. Hanukkah to our Jewish friends, brothers and sisters. Frank, th- I mean, you're here for the third time. How's it feel? Uh, I mean, it must mean it must mean that we really re- need your counsel. <laughs> it's the highlight this, of my year. <laughs> this time of year, <laughs> I've, I've gotten to the point now where I look forward to this. <laughs> get into some really deep, deep discussions, right? Yeah, about about well, about faith issues and about Jesus and about about the reason for the season. Yep. And and uh, I think we talked about this last year. I mean, we with everything that's going on in the world. And I asked you this question a couple of years ago. What do you think God is doing? I think I have the same answer, too. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a tremendous tension in the Christian community uh, between uh, people who uh, are uh, lamenting the loss of influence and power mm. and are trying to figure out how to get it back. And uh, the fewer people, I would say, the fewer people in the Christian community who recognize that um, as you read through Scripture, uh, Christianity was never about worldly power or influence, and that God does his best work actually in exile and remnant. Hmm. And that we're, gonna, we're in a sense go- in exile and going deeper into exile. And it's, it's sort of a cleansing process. I think the remnant's going to be smaller. I think you're, uh, you're, in some respects, you're weeding out people that are uh, a little bit soft on, on biblical doctrine. Woo, right out of the gate. Yeah. Wow. Just I offended just, people. Kaboom. Yeah. Well, Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, but, it's, but it's... Well, you asked. No, <laughs> I think, I, well, and I think it's an important question because I mean, when you look back in the last three years, that, that has to be on anyone who's a believer, anyone who confesses that that Jesus is their savior and and believes in in the holy trinity has got to be looking around saying what, what what does this mean if god is sovereign if god is in control what what does all of this mean well the interesting thing you, you look at i mean even since last year when we talked um, and we talked about the diminishing attendance at church it's even gotten significantly worse uh, numbers are way, way down mm. across the board. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The and I think so. I so when you talked about the the remnant last year, uh, I had a, my own thought process about what thought process about what that looked like. But now you're right. It's definitely going to be smaller. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that the challenges will be greater for believers because there is so much unbelief across the country and across the world uh, and it's becoming more and more challenging to find those that that you can have communion with in that regard mm-hmm. the but I also I mean you're absolutely right about those that are, are fearful of losing power and influence and I love the way that you put it that that's not the way this is supposed to happen. It, it, we, yes, these are challenges, but we can't rely on our elected officials or the government or anyone else to try to fix this. I That's mean, we have, to, we have to create the bulwark within our own families to protect our, ourselves from those things that we see as challenging our faith. Yeah. So... Uh, I want to make a couple of clarifications, too. Um, in, in what I just said, I, I think that maybe some people who are listening might think, oh, he's an end times guy. He's pretty sure Jesus is putting on his sandals and getting ready to come. Somebody yeah, who says something I mean, like that, he's sure Jesus. And I got to tell you, I'm not an end times guy. I have no idea when Jesus is coming. I, I don't think he's coming next week. And he said that no one knows. And so anybody who claims to know doesn't know. <laughs> right. Okay. Exactly. Uh, and I've done enough teaching on that kind of stuff to know that there are always people who are going to say, I know that scripture says no one knows, but 
Pastor Frank, I do know. <laughs> I've had so many of those conversations. You don't know. And I don't think it's imminent. I don't. And I know there are a couple people in my congregation who think it is. But frankly, it's not even something that I worry about. So I'm not an end times guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It could happen. It could be another 10,000 years. I have no idea. I think I told you before we went on recording, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in my world ending before the world ends. <laughs> yeah. anyway. So that's my selfishness coming out. But that's one thing. I'm not an end times guy. And the other thing is uh, I'm also still deeply committed as a church and as a believer to be outward focused, that the gospel still calls me to be. I'm, I'm not... I'm not trying to batten down the hatches or anything like that. I, right. I still want to be outward focused. I want to serve and love my neighbors. Uh, but I'm just recognizing that uh, a person of faith in our culture today um, is going to be marginalized and also is going to be scary to people who don't understand that. Yeah, yeah. that's a great point. Well, and I appreciate your clarification. I, I, I didn't interpret you as being an end times guy because I'm the same way. I... I mean, I think this could be, we, we don't have any idea, as you point out, and there could very well be iterations of an ebb and a flow. It could be that we're going to, the remnant's going to become very small and then it might grow again right. because there's been right. some outreach and there's been some eye opening and because it's going to get bad. Mm -hmm. And when it gets bad, people, you know, there are some people who will say, wait a minute. Right. And turn their, turn their face to God. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I, I've always, I remember a number of years ago, uh, I got really deep into the end times, you know, digging through revelations, trying to, you know, check all the boxes. And then I kind of realized it could be a hundred, it could be a thousand, yeah. it could be 10,000 years. We, yeah. time is not an issue for God. Right. So, yeah. you know, we are completely at his mercy and will. Right. Agreed. Yeah. So, but, but you know, begs the question: How do we, how do we get closer to God in in a season like this? How do we? And and and, and the obvious answer is oh, through Scripture, through 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 worship. But but for a lot of people, it's just hard. It's hard to yeah. it's hard to open their Bible. It's hard to make it to church with it, with all the different things that are going on in their lives. And they and a lot of people have lost faith, and they've lost you know they they've lost faith in some of the things you were talking about, their institutions, their communities. Um, I mean, you, faith in government is at all time low for, for yeah. anything. And, and to your point is, is it, you know, the, the lesson in that is that you cannot put faith in, into, you know, elected officials into governments. You have to put faith in Jesus right. and understand that. But people are, I think a lot of people struggle how best to do that, especially yeah. during the holidays. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> this is kind of broken record time, but uh, first of all, you have the tension of the holidays. Everybody that I know says sometime around August or September, this year I'm really going to manage my time and my schedule better, and I'm not going to be exhausted by the end of the holidays. And then nobody does it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all exhausted and sort of frustrated by the end of the holidays. That's just the way it goes. So there's that tension there. There's so many distractions that pull us away from this. Um, we also, I've ha I had this conversation just yesterday with somebody uh, sort of lamenting the fact that people don't really like reading the Bible as much as they used to. Mm -hmm. We're not as well versed in the Bible. And, and that's one of my favorite things to do is to read scripture because it's living and breathing and, it's, and, and it never changes, but it's always changing me and always meets me where I am. And so it's probably, and I read a lot, but, but the Bible is the most important thing that I read, but a lot of people struggling to find time to be able to do that, even with all the conveniences of, of uh, audio Bibles and oh, all yeah. of that stuff, they still, not, not too much, although I know people who are taking advantage of that. Um, also making sure you're in a faith community um, around other believers so you can, you can sharpen each other. And then, and then recognizing that just, just going to a Sunday service a couple times a month is never going to be transformative. It's, you know, we're dealing with these distractions and the pressure of culture uh, 167 out of 168 hours a week. One, one, hour, one hour at church isn't necessarily going to push back very hard against that. So 
there has to be a discipline to be able to get into community, get into the word, get into prayer, um, and be willing to do a couple of extra things. Serving is one of them, finding ways to serve, but also getting into Bible studies too. It's amazing to me, um, we don't have a large congregation, but it's not small, it's kind mm. of medium sized, but uh, for the size of our congregation, um, it, it's interesting to me how many people I do get to meet one-on-one -on -one to just read through scripture together, and that's a privilege to be able to do that. Um, but I don't think it's enough. Yeah, I, it's not enough people. I and I've told people I'll I'll set aside other things in order to sit and read scripture with you for an hour and talk about it and, and unpack it. So I think that's an important thing. And those people that I do it with seem to have a better handle on what's going on as well. Well, I, I mean, I think that's become self-evident. I mean, the fact that you get into the scriptures more will prepare you better. Yeah, sure. For the the challenges of everyday life. I mean, that's the whole purpose we have. This guidebook, yeah. the roadmap says, hey, you know, you, you want to know how to live your life? It's here. <laughs> it's God breathed. It's right here. Yes. But, right. but, you know, but the problem with our culture today is, is that's in, and, and, uh, is that people, they, they want to be their own gods Yeah, and they want to worship their own gods and they think, they think, you know, they want to have their own idols and <laughs> The idolatry in our culture today is just un, unbelievable. It's 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 greater than it's ever been. Yeah, and and so when people believe that I'm in control, that it's about me, it's about my happiness, it's about my abilities, my 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 understanding of the world is much more important than God's under, knowing, all knowing, understanding of the world. And I can be God. You know, the whole, I mean, we, we can digress into politics a little bit. I mean, the whole, I think, abortion debate is completely about that. I can be God. I can choose. Mm -hmm. And and then the darkness that ensues for people who believe that yeah. is monumental. And it's been proven <clears throat> for thousands of years of yeah. history. So and, and it doesn't matter. I mean, that's one example, but it, does, it you can go across the board in our culture to see everything that's going on that is just unnatural to God's yeah. will. And, and and it's people saying, I can be God. I can choose. So here's the problem. Oh, don't say problem, Frank. Here's the challenge. Here's the opportunity. <laughs> be positive. Okay, think positive. Here's the opportunity. The opportunity is that uh, if you were to tell people, well, you, you're going to worship something, they'll say, oh, no, I don't. I'm not a worshiper. Well, yeah, you are. We're all, we are created and made to worship. We're going to worship and serve something. The question is, what, it, what is it? Yeah. Okay? And so when you tell somebody who is an idolater, you have false gods, they'll tell you, no, I don't. Uh, you know, I believe in science. That's not a god. I believe in political ideology. I believe in myself. That's the biggest one. That's the biggest one. Uh, so they're, they're going to say that they're not idolaters. But if you read all the way through Scripture, again, Old Testament and New Testament. By the way, same God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I've had those conversations too. I like the God in the <laughs> New Testament. I'm always amazed by more that. More than the That's... God in the Old Testament. It's the same guy. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm always amazed by that I'm sorry, sort of same digression. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but the very first commandment in, in the Torah is have no other gods before me. And then all throughout the Old Testament, the biggest problem with uh, God's people, the Israelites, is that they become idolaters. They, they pick up their <clears> gods, <throat> false gods. And then you get into the New Testament. And it's all over the New Testament too, especially Apostle Paul's writings. Read the second half of Romans chapter 1. It's all about idolatry. And yeah. who's the idol? Who's the greatest idol? It's me. It's myself. And that's where we are today. So Gospel Coalition, I don't know, a few years ago wrote an essay. Somebody wrote an essay there and said, oh, the greatest idol right now is politics or political ideology in the United States. And, and I said, yeah. That's about right, but it still is rooted in, in, in idolizing myself. So it, as it's manifested, it's, it's, in, it's in status, it's in power, sometimes it's in wealth, but really self, politics, status, and power, those are all the ones that are the big ones right now. And I'll even say this, when I do premarital counseling, this is one of the things I talk about um, with the couple is uh, 
I think we do a pretty good job at our church of saying, hey, you shouldn't have false gods. That's a problem. There's one true God. It's, um, it's Jesus Christ. Have, he's God. Don't have false gods because it gets in the way of your true worship of the one true God. The, prob- the other problem with false gods, though, is it gets in the way of our horizontal relationships, too. Mm-hmm. It's part of what destroys our horizontal relationships as well. Why is the country so divided? The God of politics, the God of me, the God of my sexuality, the God of power, the God of status. That's why we're divided now, right. too. So it, it's not just a problem in our relationship with God. It's a problem in our relationship with others. And if you have two people getting married that have a false God problem, those false gods are going to clash, and it's going to have a problem in their marriage, too. Right. Well, and it's, I mean, it's the very evident from the whole structure of the Ten Commandments that it's God, and then it's loving others. Mm-hmm. And, and you can't do one without the other. That's right. Yeah. You, you can't love others if you don't love God, and you certainly can't love God if you're not loving mm-hmm. others. So, so, so when you cited Romans, I, I pulled something up that, that I'd highlighted a while ago, but it sparked something. Romans chapter 14, verse 7, which says, For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Mm -hmm. And then verse 10, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Right. For it is written. Now, that's where Paul is saying best case scenario. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That's at the end of Romans. You go back to Romans 1, and he's, he's just, he's nailing what the human condition problem is. Oh, yeah. The, the Roman dis- road's a hard our, road. Our <laughs> disordered no nature it. is a problem. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, it, we, are, we are fallen people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and if you've raised children, <laughs> you understand that right away. Yeah. No kidding. Especially during the holidays, it yeah. seems. Seems like like we you know that that fallenness and brokenness just rears its right. ugly head, especially with kids during the holidays. I never taught my daughters to be selfish or to lie or to any of that stuff, and they nope. fig- they were able to figure <laughs> it out, figure on, their it out all on their own. <laughs> yeah, it's a nature thing. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I mean, my, even uh, it's been as I've you know with the two young ones, I've I've had a chance now that I've had many more years of experience in my life to really watch how they've developed. And it is amazing. I, I didn't notice it as much with my first round of kids, but boy, they become very good liars at a very, very sure. young age. I mean, she sure. was two when she was just blatantly lying. Yeah. It's like, wow, <laughs> it's incredible. Because already they've figured out that I am God. Right. That's who they want to be God. Yep. It's yep. the idolatry of the self. Yeah. And so. that's a lot to, so, so there is, it's, it's so when, when and, and I think it's important for people to understand, we're not criticizing you, we're not judging you when we say this, because we're all there. I mean, I'm definitely guilty of that and sinful, but it's a, we have to be asp- aspiring to, to overcome that, mm-hmm. right? We're not ever going to be perfect. Nope. And so there's no, there's no sense in beating yourself up. You know, you're not going to be Instagram worthy, right? It's, you just have to live your life as humbly and as much in the, in the sense of every day trying to understand what is God's will for me and what is God's will for my family and try to follow that. Uh, but we're all going to fall short yeah. every single day. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's both the struggle and the joy of life, right? Mm-hmm. That, that I mean, the struggle is, is, is you know, as long as you get to the point where you realize that you are broken and uh, that you do need a savior and you do need, and, and, and a lot of times you do need to change. Yeah. And I always, I always, you know, I'll talk to people who are lamenting about a family member or a friend who's just in, in a, you know, either a swath of addiction or, whatever it might be, and they're really struggling. I go, well, God's got them, and you just need to keep praying for them. But even if they don't know God, God knows them. And 
yeah, I mean, things might might turn bad for the worse, but if they, but, but God's going to keep working on them, and and he, they're never alone. Mm-hmm. And that's even even in, I, I was at a Bible study the other day, and we were talking this about the presence of God, and and even when we're alone in our deepest darkest despair, you know, how many of us have during that time have picked up a Bible? And the scripture that we needed, the scripture that we absolutely had to hear, is opened. Mm -hmm. And there it is. Yeah. And then we begin to heal. Yeah. And then that Bible becomes very, very real. Yeah. And and very justified (laughs) and completely and totally needed. Yeah. That's happened to me. I can't tell you how many times. Yeah. Like, wait, why did I open to this passage? Why did I even think about opening to this passage. Well, it's because someone's whispering in your ear. Right. And if you have ears to hear, you're going to act on that. That happens a lot too. <clears throat> on Sundays, somebody will come up and say, how did you know what was going on in my life? Oh. Like, <laughs> you know, our preaching calendar was set last year. <laughs> yeah. So it had nothing to do with me and knowing you what was going on. Uh, our founding pastor, Tom Schrader, actually had a situation once when he was doing a marketplace Bible study and people would invite friends and unbelieving friends to this Bible study. And he was a dynamic teacher and speaker and everything. And so this lady bought, brought a friend one day and Tom got up there and was doing his thing. He had no idea who these people were. And the lady got mad at her friend who invited her because she said, you knew that Tom was going to talk about this today and, and it was going to convict it was going to confront me and convict me. <laughs> I have no idea what he's going to talk about. Oh, yeah. You know, it couldn't have been God. It was this right. elaborate yeah. scheme of human beings. That, right. Well, and I, and I bet it was a big, like, argument to get her there. And it was. It's and always. Then, and and Tom, Tom actually found out about it because they were standing in the parking lot arguing, the two women. Oh, I'm sure. After yeah. the Bible study. <laughs> and he walked up and he was just like, hey, are you guys okay? And, and the one lady says, tell her. <laughs> and he's like, tell her what? He said, tell her I didn't know what you were going to talk about today. <laughs> tell her this wasn't a setup, you know. Yeah, it's all, I, big, I, all big conspiracy. <laughs> yeah. I always find that the the Sundays when it's hardest to get to church is really when we need to get right. there. Right. Like Absolutely. it becomes it becomes uh, a mission yeah. for me. Like get in the car. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because the wheels are falling off, and we need to mm-hmm. we need to get there. Mm-hmm. And then when we're there, everything just sure happens. I, and then the rest of the day goes so much better. And I got to tell you, I experience that all the time, too. It, I mean, we're busy, and, and there are times when I just, I really want to just relax and stay at home. But I have a commitment. There's this uh, thing that I got to do with some people, and I'll not want to go. And then I'm driving home from doing that, and I'm thinking, well, I'm glad I went. Yeah. That was way better than staying at home. Yeah. So it's the same thing. Yeah. And that's, that really is kind of the essence of service. It's always, maybe not always, it is usually a challenge or an inconvenience in your mind before. And then afterwards, it's like, I can't imagine not having, not having done, done, it. done it. Yeah, sure, sure. So, I mean, that brings us the biggest brings us to the biggest question of the season. It's like, what is, how do we find just meaning in the birth of Jesus with all that is going on in the world? Well, I like the question up until you add that clause with all that's going on in the world. <laughs> um, but it's, so, I mean, what, what, for people who are somewhat believers, kind of on the cusp, don't know really, I mean, what, you know, they get wrapped up in the Christmas season. They buy lots of gifts. They, you know, they love all the, all the pageantry of the mm-hmm. season, but but they don't take time to really invest in the Emmanuel. Yeah. You know, how do we get there? First of all, it's not up to us, so there's freedom in that, but there's also still a call by God through Jesus Christ that we are to proclaim and to teach. So we have a calling and we have a responsibility to proclaim and teach, but it's really a, a, a work of the Holy Spirit that's going to start working in people's lives. 
And you can never tell who, where that's going to happen, who that's going to happen with. We're just called to be obedient and faithful to proclaim it. So that's what I do. And then allow the Spirit to do His work in a person's life. And, and we, you, you pray, you hope that that happens. Uh, and then as people respond, then you can go deeper with them. But if, if, you start, if you start feeling responsibility for somebody else's salvation or their transformation, mm. that, that becomes a pretty miserable life. Yeah. Because there's really nothing you can do. You can't argue somebody into the kingdom of God. You can't argue somebody into, the, into belief. Um, that is a great it's, point. It is logical to me. It's rational. It's logical. It's reasonable. In a world that is now uh, dominated by emotional rationalism, it, the, the scriptures are still logical, rational, and reasonable to me. And I can make that case, but that's not going to convince anybody. Uh, only the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit and the person's uh, mind and heart is going to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I'm reminded someone told me years ago, you know, you, you don't convert anyone. No. And, and so you can stand on a street corner with a bullhorn all you want. Right. But you're not converting anyone. Right. That, and and it's, it's a process. It's not a, you know, it, it's not a, a pronouncement. Right. And, and, and when you do commit, if you're someone who is on the, on the fence and, and then you finally do say to yourself and to the Lord, I am yours. I always say, watch out mm -hmm. because then the cleansing begins. Yeah. And then everything, yeah. Oh, yeah. everything sure. that you, that you idolized, everything that you thought was important is going to get stripped away very, very quickly. And it's going to hurt <laughs> and it's not going to be fun. So, I mean, following Jesus, I always say to people, it's not all sunshines and rainbows. No, it is. Or cupcakes and muffins. It, cupcakes and A lot muffins. of broccoli and carrots. <laughs> because, <laughs> and, and I think that's, that's kind of the other part of the argument is that so many people don't want to give up, right? right? Going back to what we started with, don't want to give up with their sense of control and don't want to give up their sense of self. But the problem is that you're going to have problems in this life anyway. Yeah. And God never, God never promises. You read scripture again. God never promises to take you out of a bad situation, but he does promise to walk through it with you. Now, is there any other philosophy or system or politic that's going to take you out of all your bad situations? No, we've been trying to do that for thousands of years. Right. It doesn't work. Um, let me also speak to, and okay, here we go. Now, now this will be the stuff you edit out. <laughs> <laughs> so in Romans 1, you, you talked about how if you give your life to God, there's going to be some cleanup that happens. Yeah. In Romans 1, uh, God specific, or Paul specifically starts talking about how um, though we know what the truth is, we know the truth of God, we actively try to suppress the truth. Mm. Okay, so that, that Greek word for suppress literally means something that cannot be held down forever. It's like if you've ever been to the beach and you try to put a beach ball under the water, you can hold it down for a couple seconds, but eventually it's kind of come back up. Right. That's, that's what it means, okay? Uh, so we actively try to suppress the truth, and as a result, we begin to worship that's what, that which is created rather than the creator. We become idolaters. And, and God says, I'm going to reveal my wrath through that. There's that word, wrath. That's the one where you're going to go, okay, we've got to edit that out. That's going to offend people. Wrath is not a <laughs> word we use today anymore. Nobody wants to hear about God's wrath. But Paul talks a lot about God's wrath and the reality of it. But there are two kinds of wrath. And the rest of Romans 12 talks about what's known as God's passive wrath. Mm -hmm. So there is, there's his active wrath. You know, there was the Babylonian exile. That would, be, that would be his active wrath. That would be the fact that he uh, caused the Babylonians to come in and take them into exile. That's his active wrath. He's disciplining his children, mm. his people. Okay. Then there's his passive wrath, where, and, and Paul says this three different times in 24, 26, and 28, verses 24, 26, and 28. He says, God gave them over yeah, God to gave their them passion. Up. God gave them up. God gave them over. Okay, why? That's his passive wrath. He's saying, okay, you want it your way? You can have it your way. 
you need to understand, though, you're going to suffer some consequences for wanting it your way. But you've told me you don't want me in your life. Okay, fine. I'm, I've been pursuing, pursuing, pursuing. You've been suppressing the truth. You've said no. You're your own God. Fine. Have it your way. So the passive wrath is actually the natural consequences of living a life without God, which eventually come sooner or later. So there's passive and active wrath. Here's the point of all of that. If you're living in that passive wrath of God, that's when you should be really scared because that means God has taken his hand away. That's a great point. So, so yeah, if you're being right. disciplined by God, you should be thankful that right. you're being disciplined by God because it means that you're still his. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't come back and still be his. I'm just saying that if you're being disciplined by God, by his active discipline, that's actually a good thing in your life. We don't like it. Everybody hates discipline when you're going through it, but, you know. Yeah, it's, an, it's I have Romans 1, verse 24 pulled up. I mean, Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst yeah. themselves, yeah. because they exchanged truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator right. who is blessed forever. That's right. Yeah, I... That is a big slap in the face yeah. to a anybody who really doesn't understand what that means and right. finally realize it. Right. And it's, it goes for any sin. Right. I mean, if, you, if you've decided most consciously that I'm going to worship myself and I am going to live a sinful life, no matter what that looks like, and I, 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 I don't need you, God. I'm going to keep you at a distance. Mm -hmm. And then when he gives you up, that you, it it's it's chaos. It's going to be fun for a while. Oh, <laughs> again, Schrader. Oh, well, I, 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 you know, I mean, we can go deeper. I mean, I probably could look at ten years of my life where that was sure that was probably me. Yeah, absolutely. Our, again, our founding pastor, Abs Tom, absolutely. He, he used to say all the time. He I think said, that's look, why it hit me so much in the head. It, like, if you're not having fun when you're sinning, you're not sinning correctly. Yeah. <laughs> But the problem is, is that that only lasts for a season. Yeah. Eventually, there's going to be consequences to pay for that. And, and, and people around you are going to be hurt by, yeah. and, and destroyed by that as well. And you may not see it right away. You, you feel like you're in the clear for a while. But uh, the devastation of your sin in other people's lives can become pretty apparent, too. Yeah. And, that's, and that's no fun. And then it's always somebody speaking with the voice of God. Mm -hmm. It could be a friend. It could be your wife. Right. Exactly. In my case, it was. Yeah. Who says you need to figure this out? Yeah, and you you literally need to come to Jesus. Yeah, because your life is falling apart. Yeah, yeah, amazing, amazing how that works. And we've all been there. Yeah. This is not like a unique thing. And this is what I, you know, I, I, what I talk to people about is like God's going to get you. It does, you might not, <laughs> you might not want mm -hmm. that, and you might not think you need it, but eventually. You know, this, this, whatever life you th you're li living that you think is so glorifying to yourself, it's yeah. going to get really old really quick. Yeah. Uh, and you're going to realize that it doesn't fulfill you, oh. you know. Amen to that. Um, I, was, I was listening to, I didn't read it, I was listening to uh, Will Smith's autobiography, which is fascinating autobiography before he slapped <laughs> before it was before, the, before slap, the slap. But I will tell you, reading his autobiography, I understand the slap. Now, at uh, least I think okay. I do. Okay, that's a whole nother That's a whole nother podcast. I think we ate, um, did a little thing. Will Smith is kind of like Solomon in that um, incredible wisdom insights, but essentially doesn't really take his own counsel for a lot of, a lot of it. So it was an interesting book. But at one point he said, um, he said, the problem with sex, money, and fame is that when you don't have them, you can blame all your misery on them. Hmm. And then he says, once you get him, and he's, got, he's gotten them, you know, right. he's Solomon, he's King Solomon. He says, the problem is once you get them and you realize that it hasn't fulfilled that void in your life like it did with him, he says, then you're left with a terrifying thought that maybe you're the problem. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that great? I mean, that's it's pr like, pretty good that'll preach, man. I'm yeah. telling you, that'll yeah. preach. Absolutely. Well, you know, wow. I might have to see Will Smith in a whole new light after. Yeah, you, you I've should. I've always liked Will Smith. He, I, he, I felt bad about what happened. I, I did too, and I've always liked Will Smith too. I, I think he's a great entertainer. By the way, um, he read his own autobiography, and that's why I listened to it because he's the guy reading it. So all the emotional inflection mm. is in the right place. Oh, 
By the way, you might be surprised at this. There's a little bit of language in that. I, I, would, I would imagine. <laughs> I would imagine. See, the autobiography that I'm listening to right now is uh, uh, Surrender by Bono. Oh, and, yeah, I've heard that's good, too. And it's excellent because yeah. he does, he sings on it, there's music, yeah, there's yeah. all this great stuff, but the whole thing is about Jesus. The entire, yeah. and, and you have to have ears to hear, but it's yeah. all about his walk with Jesus through the music, yeah. through everything else. And it's, it's really uh, interesting. I'm going to put that on my it. list. You're not the first person who's told me. Yeah, that's it's, uh, and, and yeah. some people might not hear it because he's very subtle about it, but yeah. it's really, their entire career has been about worship yeah. and, and glorifying God. So, you know, a good, good listen for sure because he narrates it. So but, um, if I may interject, you, you've asked a couple of times in your questions, you know, considering the world we're living in, culture, all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, since I since I just promoted Will Smith's book, <laughs> let me promote a very serious book that will that I guarantee you will help you understand what's going on in our world today. Uh, and I've read it twice now. Hmm. At the end of every year, the beginning of the year, so January eighth, I'll do this at at our church. Uh, I do kind of a past year, present year review thing, and then and then at the end of it, I say, here are the top eight books that I read in this last year. And I'm surprised that people are really interested in that. This book made it in 2021. It's going to make it in 2022 again. It's the only book I've ever had on the list twice in a row. And it's called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. Hmm. Um, it's a little bit academic, but not beyond your reading prowess at all. I graduated from North Phoenix High School. If I can read it, anybody can <laughs> read it. Okay. Um, but it gives an amazingly comprehensive and yet brief review of everything that's happened to get us to where we are today. And at the end, he, he has counsel for what he thinks the church should be doing in the midst of this, which um, I think is pretty much spot on. But I would highly recommend this book to both of you and to anybody who's listening to this. Carl Truman, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. We'll, right. we'll get a link on that on the when we release the podcast. Too. And Carl, if you're listening, you can send the check to Redemption. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, during this Christmas season, you have a lot of really cool things going on at Redemption. Why don't you, at Redemption Arcadia, why don't you update our listeners on that? Oh, wow. Um, well, this transcends the Christmas season. Uh, we I are mean, actually growing. Uh, and so we, fantastic. we announced, uh, we, we'd been working on it for more than a year up until November 6th. On November 6th, we announced that we were um, uh, starting a, a uh, building initiative. It's called Sacred Space. We're building a, a new, larger sanctuary Yeah. because okay. we're just essentially out of room. Um, our children's ministry is, is uh, huge and going well. Um, so we're growing, and so we're in the midst of this initiative to raise money to be able to build this, and we're going to break ground in, in May right now. And the idea is that we'll open, and you know, I got to tell you something. I, I hold these schedules very loosely, oh. <laughs> <laughs> as you should. <laughs> we well, think we <laughs> think we might open it March 2024, but uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I would hold if it that wasn't budget June 2024. Too. Yeah, the budget too. But uh, actually, that's going very well. We're really uh, encouraged and thrilled with the response of the congregation uh, to that at this time. Um, we're going to have three Christmas Eve services uh, Saturday, so 2, 3.30, and 5. Mm. Um, we used to do a later one, like it, we tried 11, we tried midnight, we tried 9, and uh, essentially it was just staff. People in Arcadia <laughs> go to sleep early on Christmas Eve, so yeah. we gave up on that. Now we're just doing them in the afternoon. Uh, no, and then, people in Arcadia are, are still up. <laughs> yeah, still up. Yeah, they're just not thinking it's about church. Maybe. Yeah, there's... Um, so then... Um, uh, uh, we did this six years ago when Christmas was on a Sunday. Uh, we're not going to have our regular services on Sunday, but um, myself, my son-in-law, who is in town now, mm. and a guy who is potentially a future son-in-law, mm. um, uh, the three of us are going to lead a Christmas hymn sing at 10 o'clock in our sanctuary. Oh, great. And kind of come as you are, if appropriate, come in your, if you have appropriate pajamas, come in your pajamas. But you can bring blankets and stuff and the kids. and We don't get out so. of our pajamas all day. Well, come and like we, sing, come and sing Christmas songs with us. For yeah. 45 minutes, it's a lot of fun. That's not a bad idea. 
that's it. And then we're, we're in and out, and uh, uh, that's about it. So we're doing that. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, we, we just go into our regular year. The next year, we already have our preaching calendar set. Oh, here you go. We're going we're gonna to do um, Isaiah 40 to 55. Ooh, that's a good one. We're going to have seven weeks on biblical sexuality right around Easter. I'm not sure about how that all goes together. Anyway, um, then we're going to do... That goes um, right back to Romans 1 <laughs> right there. Right. So... Um, uh, one of the one of our other lead pastors at Redemption, a guy named Josh Butler, wrote a book on uh, it's it's uh, it's a book on biblical sexuality, and it's going to be coming out in March. And so we're going to kind of preach through that um, uh, those seven weeks. We're going to do First John, and then for 16 weeks in fall of 2023. In order to prepare everybody for the election in 2024, oh we're going to work our way through the Book of Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds we're so excited <laughs> <laughs> that that is a sign of a true bible church we okay. are we're, we're going right into revelation I, the I don't care if it prepares them for the election or not but we are <laughs> going to go through the book of revelation and not just the first three chapters i love how churches will say we're going to do revelation and then they just do the first three chapters which are those letters and then they don't get into any of the other stuff oh yeah right so we're doing the whole thing that's great nice yeah. fantastic and and where are you guys located exactly uh, 3330 East Camelback. So essentially, yeah. if, if there were a 33rd Street in Camelback, that's where we are. Yeah. So right in the heart it's of great Biltmore, Arcadia. Yeah. Very, very modern. Very cool. Yeah. So. so. Well, thank you yeah. so much for being Thanks here. Thanks for having Thanks me. I appreciate for your it. Insights. Good we to love, see you guys. We love the trifecta. Well, it's going to yeah. go to a quadfecta at least, <laughs> whatever you call well, it. Well, I mean, we've like like we like to say, we have three pillars here: faith, freedom, free enterprise, and it's important that we touch on the faith component more often than not. And um, we had a great podcast last. Not froth. <laughs> not froth. <laughs> no. Um, you know. It, What's what's really interesting is how many of our guests kind of weave it in in terms of their experiences and what, mm -hmm. um, and and what they're trying to work on and and keeping that at the forefront of the principles that founded this country, which faith being number one. Yeah, you know we feel is like is a major mi you know ministry for lack of a better mm -hmm. word of this podcast. Yeah. Yep. So we appreciate you. Thanks again. Well, for thank being you here. very much for asking me. I, I appreciate you guys, and I look forward to it. Yeah, have a merry, merry Christmas. You too. Merry, yeah, Christmas, merry Christmas. Happy New Year. All right. Thanks, everybody. And God Merry bless Christmas. us, everyone. See you.